He shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. Few had fellowship with the sorrows of Gethsemane. The majority of the disciples were not sufficiently advanced in grace to be admitted to behold the mysteries of the agony. Occupied with the Passover feast at their own houses, they represent the many who live upon the letter, but are mere babes as to the spirit of the gospel. To twelve, nay, to eleven only was the privilege given to enter Gethsemane and see this great sight. Out of the eleven, eight were left at a distance. They had fellowship, but not of that intimate sort to which men greatly beloved are admitted. Only three highly favored ones could approach the veil of our Lord's mysterious sorrow. Within that veil, even these must not intrude. A stone's cast distance must be left between. He must tread the winepress alone, and of the people there must be none with him. Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, representing the few eminent experienced saints, who may be written down as fathers, these having done business on great waters, can in some degree measure the huge Atlantic waves of their Redeemer's passion. To some selected spirits it is given for the good of others and to strengthen them for future special and tremendous conflict, to enter the inner circle and hear the pleadings of the suffering high priest. They have fellowship with him in his suffering and are made comfortable into his death, yet even these cannot penetrate the secret places of the Savior's woe. Thine unknown sufferings is the remarkable expression of the Greek liturgy. There was an inner chamber in our master's grief, shut out from human knowledge and fellowship. There Jesus is left alone. Here Jesus was more than ever an unspeakable gift. Is not what's right when he sings? And all the unknown joys he gives were bought with agonies unknown. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? If inclined to boast of our abilities, the grandeur of nature may soon show us how puny we are. We cannot move the least of all the twinkling stars, or quench so much as one of the beams of the morning. We speak of power, but the heavens laugh us to scorn. When the Pleiades shine forth in spring with vernal joy, we cannot restrain their influences. And when Orion reigns aloft, and the year is bound in winter's fetters, we cannot relax the icy bands. The seasons revolve according to the divine appointment. Neither can the whole race of men effect a change therein. Lord, what is man? In the spiritual as in the natural world, man's power is limited on all hands. When the Holy Spirit sheds abroad his delights in the soul, none can disturb all the cunning and malice of men are ineffectual to stay the genial quickening power of the Comforter. When he deigns to visit a church and revive it, the most inveterate enemies cannot resist the good work. They may ridicule it, but they can no more restrain it than they can push back the spring when the Pleiades rule the hour. God wills it, and so it must be. On the other hand, if the Lord in sovereignty or in justice bind up a man so that he is in soul bondage, who can give him his liberty? He alone can remove the winter of spiritual death from an individual or a people. He looses the bands of a rhyme, and none but he. What a blessing it is that he can do it. Oh, that he would perform the wonder tonight, Lord, end my winter and let my spring again. I cannot with all my longing raise my soul out of her death and dullness, but all things are possible with thee. I need celestial influence, the clear shinings of thy love, the beams of thy grace, the light of thy countenance. These are the Pleiades to me. I suffer much from sin and temptation. These are my wintry signs, my terrible Orion. Lord, work wonders in me and for me. Amen.